This is Evangelist William S. Parson, Shepherding House of Transformation, also known as HotMinistry.com. You have to put in that .com. It would help. Where Were You is a ministry where we take the lives of ordinary people and tell their stories of how they came through some extraordinary situations. Our goal with Where Were You is to encourage someone where hopelessness may have seemed to got into you. We want to be a light where darkness have seemed to overcome you. We want to bring peace to your life, to your heart. Maybe open up a better way of life for you. This is what our goal is with HotMinistry.com. Let's introduce our next guest for this week. Her name is Lynette Gill. And Lynette Gill had a situation that she's going to share with us. How you doing, Lynette? I'm doing good, thank you. Well, Lynette, now that we're here, we're going to talk about something a little delicate. And I'm sure a lot of mothers or women went through these things or have gone through these things. I know that you had a very, very rough pregnancy and a little bit about it. But I want you to tell your story if you don't mind. Could you tell us your story, please? talk about it is from the beginning because the beginning is just a big part of this whole miracle in my opinion <laughs> um but we me and my husband were trying to get pregnant um and so we went to a fertility clinic and we started that whole process we ended up getting pregnant um with a with a thing called an iui which is just an intrauterine insemination and our first round it took we found out we were pregnant on a regular pregnancy test and then part of the process is doing a blood tam- a sample to do what they call an HCG test, which is a test for hormones to see how the pregnancy is progressing. Um, my first blood test came in, and my number were, was 22, which I said is a little low, but it's okay because it's early. Um, two days later, they test you again, and your numbers at this point should double or triple. I went in, and they said, oh, your numbers are only went up to 36. Um, so that is kind of the first part of how my <laughs> pregnancy started, which was already a little crazy. Well, well, tell me when, about the numbers a little, okay, you did say they should have doubled or or something like that. So when you heard the numbers didn't really double or anything, how, how did that make you feel? Uh, definitely got scared. Thought we, um, with hearing that information, it sounded like we were probably going to lose the baby. So that's where we were just getting definitely nervous and scared and uncomfortable <laughs> with what they were selling us at that time. So, okay. So now we're nervous. The numbers aren't going up. You went through all of that to become pregnant. And now we have these complications. What were some of the complications that you had to deal with? Like, Or better yet, what are some of the things that you came through going through this? Um, so from there, once uh, basically once we realized that we were losing a baby, at least that's what we were told, um, one of the first complications we came across was the fact that I wasn't miscarrying yet. So I went to my provider. They said that there is a shot that I could have, but they wouldn't give it to me until they knew for sure I was actually miscarrying. Um, I went home that night, and I, everybody was upset. We started praying. I'm laying in my bed praying, asking God what to do. Um, at this point, it was as though he was right next to me in my ear. I heard it clear as day. God told me it ain't over till I say it's over. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Okay. <laughs> wait a minute. You're laying in the bed, and and of course you started to pray. You went to who you the only one you knew. The doctors are telling you these things. So you prayed and you said it was like he was right there. And one more time he said it's what? It ain't over till I say it's over. It's not Every over. Day. Amen. Okay, go on, Lynette. Um, so at that point, I said, okay, God, if you say so. I'm, I'm going to believe it. Um, so I prayed later that night or wee hours of that early morning. Um, I ended up getting severe cramping in my stomach. And I was like, okay, well, let's see what's going on. I have to go to the ER. I go to the ER. And they do some more blood work because that's like standard protocol. They do an ultrasound. And I get the blood results in, the ultrasound results, the ultrasound says, oh, there's the baby, it's right there in your uterus. My HCG levels went from 36 to 900. 
Wait, so now wait, wait. Gonna... I got to cut in again. <laughs> now, you was talking about Dublin. Now they done quadrupled her. They, they went off the chart. Yes, they did. And Praise so that was God. Amazing. We went from pretty much not having a baby to now, after praying and hearing God tell me that my numbers go into 900 numbers and the ultrasound can see the baby that's present in my uterus. Amen. So like, okay. All right, God, we're having a baby. <laughs> Amen. Um, so from there, we, you know, we're moving along our pregnancy. Everything's going fine. Um, about week 20 into the pregnancy, we find out that we have two more complications. They told us that we have basa previa and placenta previa. Um, Excuse me. Yes. For, for the layman's. <laughs> Could you briefly share what those two complications are, please? Yes. Yeah, so the vasa previa and placenta previa is when the placenta is covering this opening of the cervix, and the vasa previa is where the baby's blood vessels are exposed out of the umbilical cord, and they are also covering the opening of the cervix. So this so, is very serious. This is very serious. It's very dangerous. Um, any pressure applied to those baby's vessels could cause an internal bleed and kill myself or the baby at this point. And it can happen at any time. Okay, so what, what happened after you got that news? <laughs> well, after getting that news, um, I was put on extreme bed rest um, to try to take off any pressure that we could. Um, at that point, you know, my doctors are watching me very closely. We're waiting to kind of make sure everything's going well. Um, I end up at my 28-week checkup at this point, and I go check into the doctor. Mind you, my husband's not even in town at this point because <laughs> he decided to go on vacation because, you know, it seems safe enough. We're not having a baby anytime soon. So I go in at 28 weeks. My doctor looks at my cervix and she says, you know, I don't really like how things are looking for you. Um, looks like, you know, you, there's some opening. So let's, let's go ahead and get you checked into the hospital. And I was like, okay, I guess we're going to, going to the hospital. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Um, we get to the hospital, hours and hours go by. They're saying, you know what, you're not having a baby. Everything looks good. We're going to move you down the hall. Um, for observation like in tomorrow. We'll smooth you down tomorrow and we'll wait and see what happens. I said, okay. Come at come 3 a.m. Tuesday morning. <laughs> um, I have a team of nurses and doctors rushing into my room asking me if I'm bleeding out. Do I have any pain? They make me get up on all fours. They're pumping me full of drugs. Um, at this point, there is clearly something happening with me and baby. Baby's in distress. My vitals are off the charts. So they rush us into the OR, and I end up having an emergency C-section and having a baby by 3.15. Okay, let me just get this straight. So your husband's out on a vacation, because you all now think everything's normal. You all think we're going along real good here. <laughs> we didn't already had all these other things. Now here we are, everything's calmed down. He's out there. So you went into the emergency room with your husband out of town. Correct. And then the hospital, praise God, decided to just keep you and observe yeah. you. And then at yeah. 3 a.m. in the morning, we're having all kind of complications. So yeah. what So what happened at, when you're up on all fours, they're doing vitals, they're rushing you in, what happened? Um, at that point, we're, I'm praying, I'm scared, I'm like, God, oh, what are we going to do? My mom happened to be with me that night. She came with me to the hospital. Um, so she started praying because we knew something was wrong. I should be, I'm having some kind of internal bleeding. Baby might be bleeding out. Like, there's just all these things that could possibly be going on. Wow. So we are, like I said, at this point, we're just praying and asking God, okay, <laughs> how are this supposed to go? I don't know what's happening. Amen. Uh, Absolutely terrified, though. Um, and I never will forget this one moment right before they put me under. There was a nurse who, I, by the way, could not find after. She comes to me and she says, would you like for me to pray with you? Because my mom couldn't come with me to the OR because it's an emergency. And I was like, would you please? And I'm crying because I'm scared. And she starts praying with me but right before I go out. And then next thing I know, 
there's a baby that was born at, like I said, 3.15 in the morning. They had her out within 15 minutes of brushing into my room. Wow. Um, well, now I'm her. showing the picture of your baby. I mean, how old was your baby when they took her? She was exactly 28 weeks in one day, and she was born at one pound, nine ounces. So that's her in the incubator, I guess. In yes. The blue. Wow. Like that was her first night into this world. <laughs> you know, that's kind of remarkable. So I know they didn't let, let you take her home and you couldn't hold your baby. Could you explain what that, like what happened and how that was? That was really tough. So for the first nine days of her life, I couldn't even touch her. I could only look at her through that incubator. Um, and that was heartbreaking because you always hear the things that, you know, you're, you got to touch your baby and they require the human touch and all of this. But to touch her would be to hurt her. So that was that was really tough for the first nine days. And she had tubes everywhere and an IV coming out of her belly button, um, feeding through a tube down her throat. Just just a lot. <laughs> and this lasted for a while. And okay. and also know that. um well, my question is, I don't know, but how long was it before you actually was able to hold your baby or touch your baby? Um, by day 11, 12, so almost two full weeks, I was at that point able to actually hold her. What was it like holding your baby? Scary, actually. I'd never held something at that small before in my entire life. Um, she literally was like the tiniest thing that could fit between two hands. Well, there's one thing, your mammy, I won't say that, your mother was there with you, <laughs> and I know she's a prayer, and I know that I have her right here, and she wants to say something. Hello, April, how are you? Hello there, Parsons, I'm doing fine, how are you? Simply fantastic, and thank you for asking. Well, your daughter was telling us about how you were the one in the waiting room. Can you tell us yes. from your perspective what, what kind of happened during that time while your daughter wasn't really aware of what's going on? Well, I'll tell you, it was a crazy night. They had sent us over to the hospital, and then I heard them say, we need you to get up on all fours. And when they said that, I knew immediately that there was a, a problem going on. And so I immediately went into prayer and began to pray for her because I knew it was too soon for her to have the baby. So I was quite alarmed at that time. And, uh, but I, I knew that God had given to my daughter that it ain't over until he says it's over. So I just began to pray. And certainly enough, within 15 minutes, the baby was uh, out. They came back in the room and told me that, that she, the baby and mom was fine and did I want to come over to the operating room. And uh, they walked me over. When I walked in there, my daughter's, uh, she was still under anesthesia. Her stomach was actually on top of her chest. And uh, they had this little bitty thing that weighed about a pound and nine ounces and they were holding her in the air and getting ready to put her into the okay. incubator, excuse me, the incubator. And uh, so that was a kind of a crazy time, but an amazing time that that baby was breathing and surviving. She wasn't breathing on her own. Um, they had her hooked up to many things. And one of the things I remember, they told us that immediately, you know, that we would not be able to touch her, that the sound and everything was illuminated for her because she was not ready to come yet. And so there was no way we would be able to touch her. I heard the Lord say to me, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, go to where the baby is and get your blessed oil and anoint that baby. And I said to myself, I said, Lord, I was talking to myself, you know, to the Lord on the inside. And I said, Lord, I can't, how am I going to anoint this baby? I said, this, they told us already, we can't even, we can't even touch her. And the Lord said, get your oil and go now. And so I immediately, I said nothing to anyone of what I was doing. 
I just reached in my purse and I got my blessed oil and I walked around to the area where I knew that she was. And when I walked in the room, <laughs> as God would have it, I understood then why he told me to go now. They were right in the middle of changing the baby's dressings, little Kaya's dressings, and she was completely naked. And this was the second confirmation. And the nurse looked at me and said, do you want to touch her? And right in that moment, I knew that God, that was God that told me to go. And I had the oil in my hand. And as they laid her in the incubator with the top off, I put the oil in my hand and I touched this little, her little head could fit in the palm of my hand. And I anointed her head with oil. And then I had the other hand with that had oil. And then I touched the bottom of her feet. And I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, anoint this child from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. And that would be my experience with little Kaya coming into this world. Wow. Wow. That was that was quite an ordeal. Well, okay, then uh, thank you for stopping in, Mother, yes. Grandmother. Thank Silver you so much. My eyes. And, and being that we kind of know a little bit, do you think you'll ever come back maybe and share a story of where were you? I would love to come back and share a story. I believe these stories reach out to so many people and touch so many people's lives. People will never meet, but they'll meet us through our stories. I'd love to come back. Amen. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely. After the weeks of not being able to touch her and things, was her father ever have a chance to touch her? He did, he made it in. We actually called him at like five or six in the morning um, after I came out of surgery and kind of awake. He got on the first flight and <laughs> you could get a very expensive flight home, by the way. Oh. <laughs> um, he had to come see his babies. <laughs> this so was once we, he got in um, and a couple, she probably didn't hold her until she was probably a little over a month just because she was so little, he really wasn't sure about holding her. Um, but then he finally did hold her for the first time as well. How long was your baby in the hospital and when did she finally leave? So she was in the hospital 76 days. She was born August 21st, and we didn't get to take her home till November 5th. So I'm showing uh, her in this little graduation suit, <laughs> looking all cute. Is that when you all took her home? That was the day we took her home. Um, actually, one of my good friends bought us the little cap and gown um, as a really fun thing for us to help celebrate bringing her home. Correct. And what was that like? Um, it was scary to take her home, you know, because prior to bringing her home, she had, we went through several resuscitations with her, um, probably over a dozen over the time we were staying, where she completely just essentially died. Um, there was no heartbeat, no oxygen levels. Um, so we went through that multiple times, like I said, at least a dozen during our NICU stay. So bringing her home was very scary for us because she was hooked up to a heart monitor and she had oxygen on her. Um, and we had to watch these vitals because she also had two holes in her heart at the same time um, and some eye problems as well. So it was scary. <laughs> eye problems, two holes in her heart. Yes. What was wrong with the eyes? Um, her nerves and her eyes were not connected. So um, they were assuming that she had what they called ROP, actually was the um, diagnosis, which is retinal opathy prematurity or something, I think is what it was called. And she had stage one because the nerves weren't fully connected. So it was very possible that she wouldn't be able to see down the road. So I guess, again, we can say God worked that out too. Absolutely. Um, it's funny because they went back and forth in the hospital about giving her heart surgery. And then they decided we're not doing heart surgery in the hospital. We're going to wait. So we waited till she was about one. 
And then we got to the PREA because they're like, we have to close up these holes so she doesn't end up with heart infections and have these other complications with that. So they're like, we need to get her scheduled. We get her scheduled, we go to the pre-op, they do a heart ultrasound, both of those holes closed all on their own. And by all on their own, I mean God closed them himself. <laughs> Amen. You know who gets the credit. <laughs> you know who gets credit. So, and all of this took place uh, like around her first year. Yeah, this was within her first year when all this took place. So you were very, very fortunate and glad to see her at her first birthday. Absolutely, because it could have been a whole nother situation. We could not have had a baby to bring home. Well, how old is your baby now? She will be four next month. Four next month. Yes. Well, Lynette, I'm just going to show this picture of your baby. And uh, she's in this swing, just looking all healthy and cute <laughs> and everything else. And... And I just wanted to uh, thank you for coming in and sharing your story with us. I'm sure that somebody's going to be touched by your story. I know they're going to be touched. And I know there's other things in your life. You're a young lady that you've been through. So maybe some other time you might come and share another story with us. Absolutely. And a lot of young ladies will be listening to you. So thank you again for coming, Lynette. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. This is another episode of Where Were You? If you want to get in touch with us, please do. And hey, you blessed someone today.